Hello, my name is Elaine Evans. I am the one of the project managers for the Minnesota Bee Atlas. I am also an extension educator at the University of Minnesota. And I am presenting today to fill you in about a program at the University of Minnesota, which is a partnership with the Xerces Society to survey bumblebees across the state of Minnesota called the Minnesota Bumblebee Atlas. One question um, that you may have is, is why we're doing this surveying bumblebees. I'm also going to go over how to participate as well as some special information for surveyors um, that are doing this work here in Minnesota about the endangered rusty patch bumblebee. Bumblebees are a, a really good candidate for this kind of monitoring, partly because we know that they're not doing well and we want to keep track of their populations. So there is conservation concern for bumblebees in general. It's in North America, about one out of every three species of bumblebee are either endangered or vulnerable or um, experiencing populations de declines that are a concern for their um, continued existence. So, um, so because of that, we want to get um, information that we can about where bumblebees are, how they're doing. In Minnesota, this is, um, this is definitely the case. And these, the information that we get from the surveys can then be used for habitat management and plans for conservation and recovery of bumblebees. Here in Minnesota, there is a Minnesota State Agency pollinator group, and um, they put together an annual report. And in the past, they've used data that we've collected from other related programs. So through the Minnesota Bee Atlas program, we had bumblebee surveys that we ran for, for several years. And that information went into this report to help assess the trends of, of bumblebees overall, as well as um, getting information about imperiled pollinators like the rusty patch bumblebee. So these, these data that are collected with these types of surveys are, are really valuable to agencies that are working across the state to try to um, do everything they can to help pollinators. Another reason to survey bumblebees is just to get a chance for you to connect with the bee world. So um, bees are, are this bridge between, between plants to help them reproduce. And then um, the, these plants then are supporting all these other things in the world. Being out there surveying the bees, you get a chance to really see that this intimate world between the bees and the plants. So as a volunteer for this program, you, there are things that, that you can gain from your experiences, but um, we know that we also will gain from having more people out there. There's just a handful of bee scientists in Minnesota. We can't get everywhere. Having volunteers out there collecting bees and sharing those data with us has helped us a lot in the past. We're hoping to expand that and keep going and um, get these data to help inform our conservation efforts. There are a few requirements to participate. The first is that you do need the time to do this. The surveys themselves, um, you'll be doing two or three surveys. You can do more if you want per year. And um, I expect that it would take between two and four hours per survey, depending on if you're out doing these on your, on your own. There's the option to have um, people help you, which cuts down on the time. You need to have transportation to get to the area where you will be surveying. You also need a camera. Cameras on phones can work well, um, but you need to make sure that, that um, you have a camera because that is how we are gathering data from you about what you're seeing. You also need access to the internet to submit your data. If you have all of those things, and you're wondering um, how to participate, the first step is to sign up with an account at bumblebeewatch.org. 
If you already have an account there, you can just join our project. So when you're joining, um, if you're signing up, you can sign up to join the Minnesota Bumblebee Atlas. Um, if you're already in Bumblebee Watch, you can just add that project. The next step is to adopt a grid cell. So what we've done is divided the entire state of Minnesota up into these um, 50 square kilometer grids. And um, we're having people adopt, um, adopt a grid, and then it's up to you to choose locations in there to survey. The, the um, lighter purple are all ones where, um, where we want people to adopt. There is a, a slightly darker purple. Those are a lower priority. You can still adopt those, but we already have a good amount of survey information in those areas. So it's not the highest priority. The green areas here are only adoptable if you have a US Fish and Wildlife Service permit that would allow you to handle the endangered rusty patch bumblebee. So most people aren't gonna have that. So those, um, those green squares will not be available to you. The other note here is that those red areas are all areas where the rusty patch bumblebee has been recently found. So there are a number of grid cells where there is red in the grid cell, but those are still adoptable. However, your surveys have to be outside of those red areas. So, um, so those are the basics for, for signing up. Once you're signed up, you are ready to prepare for doing a survey. So the first step is to get some training. So because it is, um, I'm recording this in 2021 when we're still um, not doing in-person workshops. In the future, we hope to offer in-person workshops for people to come and get training. This year, um, all of those resources are available online. So on our website, we have a series of videos for you to go through that will give you the training that you need. We're also gonna have a couple of webinars so we can have some live Q&A to, to help answer any questions. The supplies you'll need before you go out, you'll need some vials to collect bumblebees in. You'll, um, a lot of people like to use a net as well, an insect collecting net. You'll need a cooler and ice and data sheets and a clipboard. Before you go out, you also need to do some planning. So once you have your grid picked out, you need to choose a location within that grid. And we do have some, some um, ideas for, for helping you with that through our, our training and on the website. But um, you are going to need to find areas that you have access to, public access to, and that you have permission to do these surveys within. So um, some of the, the, the state parks, some um, county parks as well, will want to know what you're doing if you're doing research within their parks. So you will need to talk to park management before going into those areas. Um, but they, so there, there are, um, there's some figuring you need to do looking at the map, looking at areas that you have access to and um, figuring out permission to go into those areas to survey bumblebees. You also can start just connecting with us. We'll have a private Facebook group set up just for people who are participating in the Atlas for us to connect with each other, answer questions and, um, and form a, a community, share, share cool finds with each other. The next step is actually gathering the data. So um, for the bumblebee data, once you have your site chosen within your grid cell, you can go there and what you'll be doing is capturing bees from flowers for 45 minutes. And I mentioned if you have um, more than one person with you, you can divide that, that time up. If you have three people out there serving, it's 15 minutes of, of collection time. For each bee that you collect, you need to note the flower that they're collected from and, and keep them straight from each other as you're collecting. And then at the end of your survey time, you will photograph and release bumblebees. So um, when you're collecting bumblebees, you're putting them in a cooler on ice. They'll become um, immobile after a while and you should be able to take some, some good photos that we can use for identification. 
after you're done collecting bumblebee data and you've released your bumblebees back out to the wild, we want you to also collect some habitat data. So we already have information about the flowers that the bumblebees are on, but we'd like to know about other things that are blooming in the site that the, if the bumble, whether, um, you know, so flowers that bumblebees weren't visiting, we want to, to keep track of those, as well as just knowing what the land use is like, what the management is like in your exact place where you were surveying, which, um, which the area that you're surveying is about a, about a hectare. So you're, you're covering about a, a baseball field size of, of land uh, or a city block. And then um, out from that, we wanna know what's happening in the surrounding landscape. Once you're done collecting your data, after you're back home, you can work on entering your data. We're using Bumblebee Watch to enter data. So um, as you'll be entering it as part of this of the project, the Bumblebee um, Minnesota Bumblebee Atlas project within Bumblebee Watch, you'll upload photos, add locations. So you do need to make sure you're keeping accurate um, locations for just your site. So we just need kind of the center of that one site where you're looking, as well as those, those floral associations. You'll also enter that habitat information as well as some information about, um, about the, the amount of time you spent. So we can keep track of the, the valuable service that you're providing. After that, you repeat. So um, ideally you will do three surveys in your grid each year, but the minimum is two. So if you can only make it out twice, that's fine. Those surveys are happening when bumblebee colonies are at their peaks. So between mid-June and mid-August, those timings depend a little bit on weather. If the spring is really late, you might, um, it, it makes sense to wait until July to start. I, uh, ideally also those, those surveys will be spaced out from each other with, with, um, with two weeks in between. When you go back um, for your repeated surveys, you can be at the same location, if that's still a good location with lots of flowers blooming. Um, if there is another location within your grid cell, that's fine to go there too. Sometimes um, flowers change over the season and you may want to try out a, a different spot. If you go out and you find no bumblebees, we still want those data. Those are important data. I know it's not as, as much fun to do a bumblebee survey where you don't find any bumblebees, but um, we do encourage you to, to keep working within your grid cell. You might wanna try some different locations, um, but as long as there's, there's flowers there, that's really important information for us to have, um, even if you're not finding bees. So I mentioned we have these training video, training, uh, online training options for you. We have a series of videos. So there's um, a, a video about just going through um, those kind of details of what do you do when you're out there to conduct one of these surveys. We also have videos about some basic bumblebee ID, which involves also recognizing things that, that aren't bumblebees, that look like bumblebees. We have a special section on Rusty Patch bumblebee identification which not everybody may see them, but it's important for everybody to keep their eye out for them. So, um, so I want everybody to, to become familiar with that. And we also have a, a video on just kind of um, bumblebee ecology and conservation to give you a background information on how bumblebees live and what we can do to help them. So I wanted to talk also about Rusty Patch Bumblebee in particular. So I mentioned this is a, an endangered species. It is federally listed. Uh, and um, what that means is that it, it has been established that this species is at risk of extinction. And because of that, it needs to be protected from harm. So even though we're doing this survey to help bumblebees, we need to be especially mindful um, and have special care to make sure that we're protecting the rusty patch bumblebee. So here in Minnesota, um, the rusty patch bumblebee has been, been widely embraced. It is our state bumblebee 
Um, it is featured on a scratch off ticket with the lottery, as well as on a license plate that you can get from the state. So we're very proud of our Rusty Patch bumblebees that we have here in Minnesota. We're one of the few places where they're still found. So we really want to do everything we can to, to protect them. So here are some tips for how to be careful around Rusty Patch bumblebees. So um, anywhere where you're collecting, we want you to look out for Rusty Patch bumblebees while you're collecting. This is especially important if your grid cell does contain one of those, those red patches um, where you're, you're avoiding going in that, that red patch, but the bumblebees, the rusty patch bumblebee could still be around there. Um, it just hasn't been sighted there yet. So there's um, a good chance if you're in one of those areas that you could find rusty patch bumblebee. So, so we want you to, um, as you're going through it and collecting bees to just take a quick look at them as, as you have them in a, in a little while, make sure that, that you don't have a rusty patch bumblebee. If you have a bee that you suspect is a rusty patch bumblebee, we want you to pause your survey. So you have you know, 45 minutes out there, but you can stop your timer when you're not surveying to do other things like this. So, um, so once you've paused your survey, spend time identifying the, the bee if it is if you really, if you still think it's a rusty patch bumblebee, once you look more closely, take a photo, take photographs, multiple photographs, so we can identify that bee and release it as soon as possible. If that indeed was a rusty patch bumblebee that you found, you can still complete your survey that day at that location. Um, again, have extra caution to try to not collect more rusty patch bumblebees. If you do see more while you're out surveying, that'd be something to note. But um, but but don't you don't need to photograph them. Don't collect them. When you get back, um, as soon as you can, email us at mmbumblebee at umn.edu with the photos that you took as well as the location where you were. So that, um, so that we can, can verify your sighting and um, let the US Fish and Wildlife Service know about it and um, get all the information to, to where it needs to be. On your next survey, you can still return to your grid, but we'd ask that you do go to a, a different location. So I mentioned there is a whole presentation just about the Rusty Patch Bumblebee, but just to, to mention quickly here, the key characters to look out for for the rest of Patch Bumblebee. There are two main features that you're looking for. The first is a black T shape that's on the thorax. So there'll be black hairs going between the wings as well as a line of black hairs coming back towards the abdomen. And the rusty patch, which is on the abdomen, it's on the second abdominal segment. So the first segment is entirely yellow. Then the second segment is mostly yellow with this rusty patch um, uh, at, the, at the kind of top edge in the middle. There, there will be yellow hairs on the other side of that rusty patch. Uh, both males and females have a similar color pattern. And um, just to, to, to let you know, there are a lot of other bees, bumblebees out there that people confuse with them um, and when you take the, the, go through the, the training, you'll see, um, get more details on, on what these are. I also wanted to point out the, the resource iNaturalist, which is a great resource. If you are um, not sure of some of the plants, some of the flowers that you caught bumblebees on or some of the other blooming flowers that you're recording in your survey, survey area, Take a few pictures, take a picture of the flower, of the leaves, of the whole plant if you can, and you can upload those to inaturalist.org. And um, there's an app also if you wanna just do that right from your phone. And um, you, it, it's a kind of a crowdsourced ID, but the, if you get enough people agreeing on what your plant is, you should be able to get some help um, figuring out what your plant is. Another 
um, thing that I wanted to let you guys know about. This is in addition to the Minnesota Bumblebee Atlas. There is a, another Bumblebee survey opportunity called the Backyard Bumblebee Count. And this one focuses just on a limited time period at the end of July when bumblebee colonies are at their peak. Rusty patch bumblebee colonies are at their peak as well as many other species. And um, we are encouraging everybody to get out and take photos of bumblebees and share them on iNaturalist. So um, this is something that we'd love for you to do in addition to your surveys that you're doing for the um, Minnesota Bumblebee Atlas. And um, just during those, those time periods to, and this is taking the idea of the Christmas bird count, get everybody going out at the same time every year. This will be the third year that this is happening so that we can see um, patterns that are happening over time with bumblebee communities. If you see other bumblebees that you want to record outside of your survey times, you can also submit those records to Bumblebee Watch. Any bumblebee record is welcome there anytime. So um, hopefully now you get uh, have a good taste of what the Minnesota Bumblebee Atlas is and um, how to participate. To find out more and to sign up, you can visit mnbumblebeeatlas.umn.edu. And there you'll find more information about signing up, about adopting a grid cell, and joining our efforts to um, track bumblebees across the state. As a final word, I want to just go back to that idea of, of bumblebees as connectors. So pollinators in general, um, one of their big values to us is their job that they do as connectors. And we can help them by making safe spaces for them, raising awareness of them, and gathering and sharing information about them. That connection that insects have to plants and plants have to people, I'm hoping that we can then um, grow that out to connecting people to each other to make this a more equitable, equitable world on every level. We have some more information about how to help bees at the, the Bee Lab at blab.umn.edu. This project is in cooperation with the Xerces Society, and they also have fabulous resources on how to help bumblebees as well as other pollinators. So I will put the, the links to the Atlas site as well as the Bee Lab site and the Xerces site in the, the comments, in the, in the information for this video. So you'll be able to easily link up with those resources. Thank you. And we hope to see your bumblebee data this summer. <laughs>